This is William Huang, and welcome to the Epidemiology and Biostatistics section for Behavioral Sciences. It's tempting to not study behavioral science as thoroughly as the other material because it is felt to be easy or a matter of common sense. This is not a good idea because many questions on the USMLE Step 1 exam are drawn directly from this material. Taking a little more time to master the basics will go a long way to improving your overall score, especially if you did not have a good biostatistics course in medical school. Common study designs tend to be highly boards testable. A case control study asks what happened because it is observational and retrospective. It looks into the past and compares a group of people with disease to a group without disease. The cases are the subjects with disease, the controls are the subjects without disease, and in a case control study, you are analyzing previous exposure. The typical metric for case control studies is the odds ratio, which in this context is defined as the ratio of the odds of exposure in the case group to the odds of exposure in the control group. But how do we define the odds of an event? The odds of an event is the probability of the event occurring divided by the probability of the event not occurring, or p over 1 minus p. Let's define P1 as the probability of exposure in the context of disease, and P2 as the probability of exposure in the context of no disease. Putting everything together, we define the exposure odds ratio as P1 over 1 minus P1 divided by P2 over 1 minus P2. An example of a case control study would be looking at exposure to thorotrast, which is a radioactive contrast agent, and the development of cholangiocarcinoma. Here, you are looking into the past and comparing cases with cholangiocarcinoma to controls without cholangiocarcinoma, and analyzing their previous exposure to thorotrast to see if cases with cancer had higher exposure rates. Suppose the study finds that the probability of exposure to thorotrast in patients with cholangiocarcinoma is 0.75, while the probability of exposure to thorotrast in disease-free patients is 0.25. In other words, P1 equals 0.75 and P2 equals 0.25. What is the odds ratio? Plugging the numbers into our odds ratio equation, we get an odds ratio of 9. A cohort study asks what will happen because it is observational and usually prospective. It can also be done retrospectively using archived records. It looks into the future and compares a group with a given risk factor to a group without the risk factor to assess whether or not the risk factor increases the likelihood of disease. The cohort is the group with the given risk factor, and you follow the cohort into the future to see if they get the disease of interest. The characteristic metric for cohort studies is relative risk, which is defined as the ratio of the probability of the event occurring in the exposed group versus a non-exposed group. An example of a cohort study would be looking at uncontrolled hypercholesterolemia and future risk of myocardial infarction. Here you are looking into the future to see if groups with uncontrolled hypercholesterolemia have a higher likelihood in the future of developing a myocardial infarction than groups without uncontrolled hypercholesterolemia. Suppose that P1 is 0.75 and P2 is 0.25. What is the relative risk? Substituting these numbers into the relative risk equation, we get a relative risk of 3. A cross-sectional study is purely observational and asks what is happening because it takes place in the present time. It collects data from a group of people to assess the frequency of disease and related risk factors at a particular point in time. It is a snapshot study design. In other words, it gathers data about exposures and outcomes simultaneously. While it can show risk factor association with disease, it does not establish causality. The characteristic measure for cross-sectional studies is disease prevalence. Disease prevalence is defined as the proportion of people in a population who have a disease at a particular time. An example of a cross-sectional study would be looking at smokers versus non-smokers and their frequency of peripheral vascular disease. Here, you are collecting data in the present moment to assess the frequency of peripheral vascular disease within a group of smokers versus a group of non-smokers. The last two types of studies are twin concordance studies and adoption studies. Twin concordance studies compare the frequency with which both monozygotic twins and both dizygotic twins develop a disease. This measures the heritability of a disease. Specifically, the more concordance a disease shows for monozygotic twins relative to dizygotic twins, the greater the heritability of the disease. 
Adoption studies compare siblings raised by biologic versus adoptive parents to separate heritability from the influence of environmental factors on disease. Clinical trials are simply experimental studies involving humans. They compare the therapeutic benefits of two or more treatments or of treatments versus placebo. So, what are the highest quality clinical trials? They would be randomized, controlled, double-blinded trials in which neither the patient nor the investigator know if the patient is in the treatment or control group. There are four phases of clinical trials that are commonly discussed, phase one through four. However, there are also new phase zero trials that are also called first in human or microdosing studies where 10 to 15 healthy volunteers receive single subtherapeutic doses of the study drug to look at pharmacodynamics and kinetics to confirm in vitro and animal data. Because they are getting lower than normal drug doses, you don't get any information on safety or efficacy. In contrast, classic phase one clinical trials study a new drug in 20 to 100 participants usually healthy volunteers, to assess the safety, toxicity, and pharmacokinetics of that treatment. Phase two clinical trials study a small number of patients, usually on the order of hundreds, with the disease of interest to assess treatment efficacy, optimal dosing, and adverse effects. In pharmacology, what are the parameters used to describe efficacy, optimal dosing, and adverse effects? Efficacy is defined in terms of Vmax. Optimal dosing is defined in terms of potency, drug clearance, volume of distribution and bioavailability, and adverse effects are defined by therapeutic index, which is the median lethal dose over the median effective dose, or LD50 over ED50. These concepts are discussed in more detail in the farm section. Phase three clinical trials study a large number of patients, often in the thousands, depending on disease prevalence. Patients are randomly assigned to either the treatment under investigation to the best available treatment or placebo if there is no approved treatment. These studies compare the new treatment to the current standard of care. It's at this stage that the treatment may or may not receive FDA approval. Finally, phase four clinical trials are designed as post-marketing surveillance trials of patients after drug approval in an effort to detect rare or long-term adverse effects. Thoroughly understanding sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, and negative predictive value is incredibly high yield for answering exam questions. This can be confusing material, but it's definitely going to show up on your exam, so be sure to spend extra time on it to make sure you've got it mastered. First, let's review how to approach questions that deal with diagnostic tests. You should always start by drawing a 2x2 two two table, comparing the test results with the actual presence of disease, as shown here. A true positive is when the test is positive and the subject has the disease of interest. A false positive is when the test is positive but the subject does not have the disease. A true negative is when the test is negative and the subject does not have the disease of interest. A false negative is when the test is negative but the subject actually has the disease. Sensitivity is the ability of a test to detect a disease when it is present. The sensitivity of a diagnostic test is defined as the proportion of all people with a disease who test positive, or the true positives divided by the sum of the true positives and false negatives. A test with high sensitivity would be a rule-out test, thus the mnemonic SNOUT. A value approaching 1 is desirable for ruling out a disease because it indicates a low false negative rate, the denominator in the above equation. If the sensitivity of a test is 1, the above equation shows that the false negatives must be equal to 0, and therefore all negative test results would be true negatives. Hence, a negative test result in a highly sensitive test rules out the possibility of disease. A diagnostic test with a high sensitivity is useful for screening diseases with low prevalence. For example, an ELISA is a test with high sensitivity, thus it is a good rule-out test for a disease like HIV. In contrast, specificity is the ability of a test to indicate non-disease when the disease is not present. Specificity is defined as the proportion of all people without a disease who test negative, or the true negatives divided by the sum of the true negatives and false positives. A test with a high specificity would be a good rule-in test, thus the mnemonic SPIN. A specificity approaching 1 is desirable for ruling in disease and indicates a low false positive rate. If the specificity of a test is 1, the above equation shows that the false positives must be 0, and therefore all positive test results would be true positives. Hence, a positive test result in a highly specific test confirms the presence of disease. A diagnostic test with high specificity is useful as a confirmatory test after a positive screening test. 
For example, a positive test result for HIV with ELISA should be confirmed with a highly specific test, such as a Western blot. This graph shows how you can shift the trade-off between sensitivity and specificity by adjusting the threshold for a positive test. Let's say you are using systolic blood pressure to detect cases of hypertension. You have a range of uncertainty from 120 to 160 millimeters mercury where the systolic blood pressure may or may not indicate hypertension. This is shown by the range here from A to C. If you set the threshold low, you pick up all cases with no false negatives, so you have a sensitive test, but you also have lots of false positives, as shown by the shaded region here, and therefore low specificity. If you set the threshold high, you exclude all patients without hypertension, so there are no false positives, and you have a specific test. But you have lots of false negatives, as shown by the shaded region here, and therefore low sensitivity. If you set an intermediate threshold, you have a test that is balanced both in terms of specificity and sensitivity with some false positives and false negatives. If you can perform two successive tests, it is best to start with a highly sensitive test, such as the ELISA for screening purposes, and then follow up with a highly specific test, such as the Western blot, for confirmatory purposes. The positive predictive value is defined as the proportion of positive test results that are true positives, or the true positives divided by the true positives plus the false positives. It is the probability that a person actually has a disease given a positive test result. So when a patient asks what are the chances they have the disease after receiving a positive test result, they are asking for the positive predictive value. The negative predictive value is defined as the proportion of negative test results that are true negatives, or the true negatives divided by the sum of false negatives and true negatives. It is the probability that a person actually is disease-free given a negative test result. So when a patient asks what are the chances they don't have the disease after receiving a negative test result, they are asking for the negative predictive value. Critical point to remember is that both the positive and negative predictive values of a diagnostic test vary with the prevalence of the disease, while the sensitivity and specificity of a test do not. Thus, if the prevalence of a disease in a population is low, even tests with a high specificity will have a low positive predictive value. On the other hand, if the prevalence of a disease in a population is high, the negative predictive value goes down even if the sensitivity is high. Thus, the higher the prevalence, the higher the positive predictive value, and the lower the negative predictive value. The lower the prevalence, the higher the negative predictive value, and the lower the positive predictive value. If you're having difficulty understanding this concept, remember that prevalence is defined as the number with disease divided by the size of the population. You can put some example numbers into the test versus disease table to see how a change in disease prevalence affects positive predictive value and negative predictive value.